Um, all right, so I was asked to talk for about 20 minutes about, uh, what am I talking about? Oh, designing policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, from energy use. So, uh, you know, it's hard to kind of cover the landscape in 20 minutes. What I thought I would do is, is try to give you a snapshot of some things I think are kind of important to know um, if you're going to be thinking about working in this area. And then uh, if you have more questions, uh, you should plan on, you can't take my class in the spring on climate change economics because I'm not going to offer it this year, unfortunately. I'll be on parental leave. But I'm thinking about doing a reading class uh, or an sp independent study for people who are interested. So if you're interested, you should actually let me know very soon so I can figure out if I'm going to do this and get all the relevant people uh, involved. Okay, so what, what does uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from energy use really, uh, really mean? Um, and here I, I have a slide that is a picture taken from the recent IPCC. That's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which if you're interested in climate change, you should know what that is. That's like the, the big international scientific community that puts out reports every five or so years. And what they did in this very clever uh, gr chart, which I guess I have to walk around the table to point at, uh, and this thing does have a pointer, right? Yeah. So um, what they did is they showed for three different fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, on one chart, first of all, they showed you uh, how, much, um, how much had been used historically uh, of, the f of the fuel in some, some uh, measure of energy. I guess it's, it's zeta joules or something. I don't know. Some large amount of, of energy. So this, this dotted line right here is basically estimates of how much energy we've used since the beginning of using energy. Um, also on this graph, are estimates of total reserves uh, or resources of those energies. So you can kind of see how much oil we think we have left relative to how much we've used, uh, and how much gas we think we have left relative to how much we've used. Um, and then you see an estimate of the cumulative use of the resource over the next 100 years or so in a baseline scenario, which is the red one. And there are lots of different dots representing lots of different modeling efforts uh, to capture what we think is going to happen over the next 100 years. And then you see what we think we need to do for that resource in order to meet two different uh, inter global climate goals, uh, one which might be thought of as aggressive but possible, and one which would probably be thought of as impossible. Um, and what you can see is that there's, there's a pretty significant consequence for what we think we have to do with coal over the next 100 years. Um, there is uh, something we have to do with natural gas, natural gas and oil, but the real consequence for mitigating climate change uh, and, and designing policies to, um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is really a lot of it is about reducing coal use. So how do we go about doing that? What kind of policies are we talking about? Well, the main thing that economists uh, are going to tell you is that what we need to do is put a price on carbon dioxide. Um, and what do, I, what do I mean by that? Well, this slide uh, is, um, there are reasons I don't like this slide and there are reasons I do like this slide. What this is, is it's somebody's effort, uh, some, some consultants at McKinsey uh, and companies' effort to list all the different things we could do to reduce um, greenhouse gases. I don't know if it's green, yeah, it is greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide. Um, from all different types of technological uh, developments or activities, um, organized from the cheapest to the most expensive. Um, so things to the left are very cheap, things to the right are very expensive, and the width has to do with how many uh, tons of greenhouse gases we could actually reduce. Um, the thing I don't like is I don't actually think there are all these negative cost uh, opportunities, but we can talk about that during the Q&A uh, if you want. But I do think these things are probably relatively cheap. So the question is, um, or that the economists would, would ask, is how do you go about making sure that what you do are the cheaper things uh, and not the more expensive things, at least uh, first? Um, and the answer is you put a price on carbon dioxide. That is, you charge people, the easiest way to think about it is put a tax on carbon dioxide. Um, and, uh, and I forgot to start my watch, but what do you think it is? We're good. You're good? Well, just where am I? Five minutes in. Okay, good. So I've got to speed up a little bit. 
Um, so what you would do is you would tax carbon dioxide, you would charge people for their emissions, and presumably if they have these other opportunities that are less than whatever price you tax at, they will undertake those activities instead of emitting the carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases associated with them. So if you, you set a price of $40 a ton over here, all these activities are cheaper to reduce your emissions than pay the tax. That's what you would do if you're a smart, a bright person. Uh, the more expensive things you would not do. So that's why economists like the idea of putting a price on carbon dioxide. And again, the simplest thing you could think of uh, would be just to tax carbon dioxide. Now, for cost effectiveness, what economists will say is you want to, uh, you want to think about these, this tax as being as broad as possible. Why? What, what is true about carbon dioxide that makes it different than other uh, pollutants that we usually deal with? Anybody know? There are actually several things, but why, why, why do I think a lot about finding the cheapest reductions wherever they are? Does it matter where the ton of carbon dioxide is emitted for the consequences? No, the people have taken my class early, and other people are shaking their head. Yes, so the answer is, is that carbon dioxide, it doesn't matter where it's emitted, it doesn't matter what activity you, you do to mitigate, um, and it doesn't even really matter when you reduce the emissions within a certain you know, period of time, like a decade. So you want as much flexibility as possible when you have this price. That is, you don't want to have a high price one year or in one part of the world and a low price in another part of the world or at another point in time because you're missing cheap opportunities in that place and period where the price is low and you're paying a lot in the period and time when the price is high. So if you're looking for the cheapest opportunities, the most cost-effective solution, you want to find those uh, cheap opportunities no matter where they are what they are and when they are. Now, one thing that we, so I tend to think of a tax as being the simplest thing, but obviously another policy that people talk a lot about is cap and trade, where it's like a tax in that the government regulates the emissions, but instead of paying a tax for every ton, you have to retire a permit. And the government issues a fixed number of permits and lets everybody trade. Now, the, simple, the one question I'll ask right now, just to kind of you know, test for everybody who's taking economics is, if I give you a bunch of allowances and you have more allowances than you need, um, do you have any incentive to reduce your emissions? What's the, if you can sell your allowance, yes. So that's the whole idea is that if there's a market and somebody is short allowances and you're long allowances, you don't just treat these as a gift, well you may treat these as a gift from God, but you don't treat them as a worthless commodity, you treat them as something valuable. Just like if I gave you, you know, 50 pizzas, you wouldn't think to yourself, well, I have enough pizza now, I'm going to go home. You'd say, well, can I give them to somebody else or maybe sell them to somebody else? Uh, so that's, that's the thinking. You think in terms of the opportunity cost. Uh, so cap and trade can be just as effective as a tax in terms of encouraging emission reductions. Now, one thing before I talk about some, some design features that it might, you might want to keep in mind is just to say it's not entirely about finding the cheapest reductions everywhere. And this little graph is something I like. It was done by a, a former colleague, Dallas Bertrot, Resources for the Future. And it highlights the idea that let's say you put, you know, let's say this is a $30 tax uh, on, uh, on, the, on carbon dioxide emissions. And here's a schedule of all the things you can do to reduce your emissions. So if you're smart, you reduce all these things that are cheaper and you don't reduce these things that are more expensive. But the thing to think about with a carbon tax or an emissions trading scheme is you may be paying the tax on all of these emissions even as you are paying a small amount over here to reduce the emissions that you reduce. So the amount of money changing hands in terms of allowance trading and allocation or tax revenue can actually be much larger than the compliance costs associated with the policy. And so this, in a way, adds a complicating feature to the design of emissions trading, if you're going to have carbon pricing or a tax or something like that, because suddenly the distributional consequences can be quite large, and you have all this money you're distributing, which is actually a cost to somebody, and you have to think about that. So here's just a quick list of important design features uh, that I, am, I like to emphasize. One is coverage. We talked about you want to make it as broad as possible, where, when, what sorts of flexibility. Uh, the more coverage you have, the cheaper the reductions you can find to reduce your emissions. 
Um, another issue that comes up if you think about taxes versus cap and trade is under a tax, you know what the price is, what you have to pay, but you don't know what your actual emissions outcome is going to do, depending on exactly how price responsive people are. Meanwhile, if you set a cap on emissions and you let people trade allowances, you may not know what the allowance price is, but you do know what the emissions are going to be. So that kind of poses a, what seems like a dichotomous choice, one or the other. It turns out you can actually do all kinds of wacky things uh, to design things that are kind of in between, where you set price ceilings and price floors, uh, and you can get pretty, uh, pretty complicated in doing that. Um, the third point I just mentioned is that redistribution turns out to be hugely important when you're pricing carbon. What you do with the revenue or with the allowances uh, is really creating a lot more winners and losers than just the actual cost of reducing emissions. So you got to think about that. A fourth thing that we, I haven't mentioned so far is it gets really tricky when you have some jurisdictions enacting carbon pricing and other ones who they trade with not enacting carbon pricing. Now, it turns out empirically it's not a huge issue when the carbon prices are low, but it can get uh, very politically uh, charged for, for certain industries, and certainly as you get higher prices, it can be more of a problem. There are a lot of other design issues that if we have more time or if people raise them, we can talk about uh, in the Q&A. Now, you might ask yourself, well, is carbon pricing happening? Well, it is. Uh, and in 2015, there are dozens of different jurisdictions around the world that have either implemented uh, a carbon tax or emissions trading program, uh, and many more places that are considering them. So here you see, um, for example, that uh, California and the New England states, both and Quebec, all have emissions trading. The European Union has emissions trading. China has a number of pilots. Um, there's also taxes. Uh, there's a tax in British Columbia right now. It's probably the best example. There are taxes under consideration in South America. There's actually, I think the tax in Mexico was passed. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the status is right now. Um, what does it say there? Implemented or scheduled. So it's supposed to be happening. Um, so we have all these examples of carbon pricing. Typically, the carbon prices are fairly low. Um, so here is just a, a graph showing market prices in some of these different jurisdictions where you see the European Union had a price of almost uh, $30, uh, $35 a ton of carbon dioxide around 2008. Now it's around $5. California has a floor, so it can't go below $12, and that floor actually rises over time. Um, and then some of these other programs like REGI, this trading program uh, in the northeastern United States, uh, has been around four or five dollars. Um, so the prices are low, but the number of, of jurisdictions that have pricing is expanding, and you do actually see a slight uptick uh, in the price over here. However, if you compare these prices to one recent government estimate of the damages from climate change, you see they're actually quite low. So the U.S. government estimated um, what they call a social cost of carbon, which is the damages caused by one ton of carbon dioxide, um, and they estimated that at about $40 a ton uh, just a year or two ago. Um, there's a process underway to try to, to, to revisit that number, um, but that's kind of an official government estimate right now, and you can see it's much higher um, than any of these um, programs. One of the things that you see is um, a lot of these jurisdictions seem reluctant to use simply a carbon price all by itself to do the work of reducing emissions. So, even though the price may seem low, California has lots of other policies to reduce uh, their emissions. They have renewables, they have energy efficiency, they have uh, clean fuel standards for cars. So there's a lot of other policies that may suggest people don't want to just use prices uh, to reduce emissions, even though economists will tell you it's the smartest thing to do. Um, most, it's not smartest, it's the most cost-effective uh, thing to do. Um, finally, I want to just talk briefly about the Clean Power Plan. How many of you guys know what the Clean Power Plan is? Okay, good. Well, that's good. There's a whole event today uh, that the Nicholas Institute was organizing about the Clean Power Plan. Um, the thing that I'll just, a couple things to highlight, it's, it's a mess. It's very complicated. It's the federal government providing guidelines for states to submit regulations that then the federal government has to approve. So just dive, parse that for a second. Um, it'll also be litigated because it's, uh, it's a piece of the Clean Air Act passed 40 years ago that no one really knew exactly was going to be used for something like that. And, um, and there are a lot of new bells and whistles the EPA has put in there. Um, but ultimately, the, gov the gov federal government has set up these guidelines. They were finalized last month. 
Um, and there are a lot of really important questions that are now left to the states as they try to decide what they're going to do. Uh, basically, all the existing power plants uh, in a state now have to be regulated. Their emissions have to be regulated. Uh, they have to, states have to decide whether they want to have a market-based system or traditional regulation. They have to decide um, whether or not they want to go alone or go with other states nearby. Um, a very interesting question we were talking about today was whether or not they're going to regulate just the existing sources by themselves or jointly regulate all the existing and new sources together. Uh, because of the design of the Clean Air Act, existing sources traditionally get regulated separately. Um, but if you think about trying to cap emissions, you could imagine capping the existing sources and then people just building a bunch of new ones and that kind of defeats the purpose. So EPA is, is uh, uh, for good reason worried about this. Um, and then the thing that I think has been kind of most interesting for economists studying this has been this question about whether or not you regulate the rate of emissions at these power plants or the total level of emissions. Um, so EPA has come up with this really uh, somewhat intricate pathway for different ways that states can comply. They can pick a mass that is a cap, or they can, they can pick an emissions rate. Then they have a bunch of different choices about, for example, whether they cover just existing or whether they cover new sources as well, um, whether or not they have separate rates, uh, if they go the rate-based approach um, for uh, coal versus natural gas, or whether they have one rate for all of them. Um, one of the interesting things is that little light green one is they don't have to necessarily have a trading program. All the ones except for that light green uh, involve some sort of trading program, but the, the states could use traditional regulation and some set of measures um, that would not um, directly correspond to a, a state cap. Um, so let me just, uh, let me just summarize. Um, and then take questions, because I, I have no idea what you guys actually want to talk about. Uh, I tried to make a guess. Um, so we're going to have to do a lot of uh, reduction in emissions if we're going to hit any sort of reasonable uh, target over the next 100 years. I mean, I think a lot of the targets that get talked about are pretty unrealistic, but even the realistic ones are a lot of work. Um, that suggests that we have to do a lot of work. We ought to be trying to do it cost effectively. Uh, to do it cost effectively, economists will suggest putting a price on carbon dioxide either through a tax or a tradable permit system. Um, there are lots of really important design features. Uh, we talked about covering lots of stuff. We talked about providing cost certainty. We talked about allocating the value that's created uh, by putting a price on CO2. And then I would add competitiveness concerns to that, that list as well. Um, and then just looking around the world, there's a lot going on. Uh, even in the United States, there are efforts to, to get at pricing emissions in the United States. Um, but we're having to work under a 40-year-old law um, because we've been unable to pass uh, new legislation. Uh, my own view is that we'll probably, to get anything substantial, we'll have to go far beyond the clean power plan. If you look at what the estimates are, um, you know, the, the actual reductions are about 15% nationally from where we are now. I mean, we claim like 26%, but that's against a baseline that we're already below. Um, so if we really want to get substantial reductions over the next few decades, we're going to have to find something more, uh, more uh, powerful than the existing Clean Air Act. So let me stop there.